Welcome to St. Paul's Online. We are glad that you've joined us today. Uh, I'm grateful for our online congregation and, and those who uh, also gather with us on Sunday morning in person. Uh, we're glad that you're here. Uh, so we have an online service, the one you're viewing right now. We also have an 8.30 and a 10.30 uh, in-person worship service in our sanctuary. And uh, you're always invited uh, on Sunday mornings to those as well. Or continue to enjoy us uh, and, and benefit uh, from what uh, we're doing here online. We're grateful that you're there. So whatever you feel comfortable with, we want you to join us in worship. Uh, I want to let you know uh, that uh, the sermon, uh, one thing I haven't said, uh, is that the sermon that I preach here is the same sermon, basically, that I preach uh, live in person on Sunday morning. So there's not a difference, uh, uh, noticeably different uh, type of sermon there. So today, we're going to explore and, and hear about some really desperate people and how Jesus met them uh, and transform their lives uh, when you think that they're about to give up. Jesus meets them and Jesus does something in their life uh, that transforms them. Uh, the, gospel, uh, the letter to the church that James wrote says this, Are there sick among you? Uh, they should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise them up, and anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another, and pray for one another, so that you may be healed. I'm going to invite you uh, uh, to leave a message uh, with the, the buttons that are available there on the website or uh, on Facebook or YouTube. Uh, subscribe to our Facebook page, our YouTube channel. Uh, if you have a prayer request or a praise, uh, we invite you to, to put that there as well. Let us know how we can be praying for you, how we can support you and encourage you. Uh, if you'd like to support the mission of St. Paul's, uh, which is to make disciples of Jesus who uh, know and love God, and to send them out into the world uh, from the heart of the city, uh, then there's an available link uh, for you to give, and we appreciate all who give and support us. Even uh, we're surprised at who's doing that, and so thank you for giving to the church. So uh, as we begin our time uh, today in worship, let me pray over you, and let me pray for you. Almighty and everlasting God, you can banish all affliction, both of soul and body. So show your power to those of us in need now, that by your mercy we may be restored to serve you in a fresh way through our holy living, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen and amen.
This is the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5, verses 21 through 34. Hear this part of this story. Then Jesus again crossed over by boat uh, to the other side of the lake. A large crowd gathered around him when he was there by the lake. Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came there. Seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him. My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered greatly under the care of many doctors and spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask, who touched me? When Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it, then the woman, knowing that uh, what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and, trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. And be freed from your suffering. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
of the most beloved and colorful sports personalities of all time was a man, man by the name of Jim Valvano. Jimmy V is what he was called uh, by sports fans around the country who knew him. Uh, Valvano died uh, in uh, April 16, 1993 after a, a long battle with cancer. He was 47 years old, uh, but he was remembered as one of the great basketball coaches. His North Carolina State team had won uh, the national championship in 1983, upsetting the Houston Cougar team uh, that featured Hakeem Olajuwon and Clyde Drexler. Valvano also remembered that, uh, or he was remembered as well, as being an outstanding TV analyst, analyst, and an eloquent, inspirational speaker and lovable because of his wisecracking jokes. But most of all, he was remembered by the courageous way he faced his debilitating illness. A few weeks before he died, Valvano was honored on national television uh, to a great uh, viewing audience. And he said this, Today I fight a different battle. You see, I have trouble walking and I have trouble standing for a long period of time. Cancer has taken away a, a, a lot of my physical abilities. Cancer is attacking and destroying my body. But what cancer cannot touch is my mind, my heart, and my soul. I have faith in God and hope that things might get better for me. But even if they don't, I promise you this. I will never give up. I will never, ever quit. And if cancer gets the best of me, I'll try my best to go to heaven and I'll try my best to be the best coach that uh, they've ever seen up there. And then he points to his 1983 championship team and he said this, I learned a great lesson from these guys. They amazed me. They did things I wasn't sure they could do because they absolutely refused to give up. This was the theme of our championship season. Never, ever give up. And that's the lesson I've learned from them. And that's the message I leave with you. Never give up. Never, ever give up. In the story, that brief story that was written, there's, there's this sense of never, ever giving up. You go all the way back to, to chapter 4 in, in Mark, and you find that the disciples are frightened by the storm, and they're ready to give up. And then Jesus speaks, and the wind and waves quiet down. There's a man tormented by uh, evil, and everyone else has given up on him. And yet Jesus restores the man possessed by legion. And when the owners of, of the pigs that the legion went into told him to leave and get away from him, Jesus approaches his ministry base in Capernaum and finds desperate people who are not yet willing to give up. There's some interesting elements in the story that we have here is that everyone is desperate and everyone encounters Jesus at his feet and they're never willing to give up. So in the story of what we find here is who are these desperate people? The first one is, is Jairus and, and his desperate, he's desperate for his daughter and he boldly finds Jesus on the shore and, and he begins this in, in verse 22 and 23 of, of Mark chapter 5. It says this, Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came there, seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she'll be healed and live. Here he is. He comes and kneels before Jesus. He was one of the, the well-known people in, in Capernaum. He was a, a ruler, a, a leader in the synagogue. It's interesting, though, that he's one of the few people that are actually named in Scripture. So he had to be somebody important. 
And he had probably listened to Jesus preach from time to time. He had probably seen the healings that had occurred and the miracles that Jesus had performed. And here he comes, desperate, as he pleads for his child. You see, she's at death's door. She's about to breathe her last breath. And so in verse 24, we find this. So Jesus went with him, and a large crowd followed and pressed around him. What happens next is interesting in that Jairus' faith and hope becomes delayed and there's an interruption. And the interruption is another desperate person. There's a woman in the crowd who's desperate in her suffering. Verse 25 and 26 says, And a woman there had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered great, a great deal under the care of many doctors and spent all she had. Yet, instead of getting better, she grew worse. This woman is desperate, but yet she's not willing to give up just yet. Her physical suffering has caused this desperation. She's been isolated from others because of that condition. She's a nobody. She's not even named in this passage. She has no status in her community. She's pronounced unclean and, and becomes this outcast and unfit to even approach God because of her condition. She suffered this chronic and unrelenting disease. She's had it for 12 years. And her illness and condition continues to deteriorate. There's not been any signs of health. There's not been any respite in the midst of it. Just a constant debilitating bleeding. And now she finds herself in poverty. Because all of her resources have been used to try to find a cure. And she has nothing left. She's left unproductive unemployable, unworthy, and unfit to be a part of the community there in Capernaum. But Jesus becomes her last hope. She's not willing to give up just yet. And in that desperation, she formulates a plan to reach out to Jesus. Verse 27 and 28 say this, When he When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Her goal was simple. It was just to touch the hem of his garment. In fact, it was probably just the tassels or the strings that were attached to his robe. And she says, if I touch it, if I touch just the fringe... I'll get well. She had focused her faith for that one final act of desperation. The doctors had failed her. The natural healing processes that normally take place in her body had failed. And the only faith that she had left was found in Jesus. And even there, the if I can just touch his garment expressed some doubt. So what happens? She she reaches out and she touches and something miraculous happens. Verse 29 puts it this way. Immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. Immediately she was healed. Her hemorrhaging stopped. She felt health returning to her body. And then Jesus stops and says something's happened. Someone's touched me. And then Jesus, it says in verse 32 and 34, through 34, but Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. And then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. 
See, Jesus recognized that something had happened, that there had been a, a spiritual transaction that took place. And so he begins to search for that person because, uh, because there's something in a person who has received this that changes them. There must have been a physical change, uh, some sense of, of something happening in her. And she reveals herself to Jesus. And she explains her whole story. And Jesus tenderly blesses her, blesses her faith and her health. In the midst of this story, I can imagine that, that Jairus is wondering, man, we got to get to my kid. We got to get, she's dying. She's on her last breath. And then Jairus loses hope. He loses his hope. Verse 35 says this, while Jesus was still speaking, some men came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. Your daughter is dead. Why bother the teacher anymore? See, there was this belief that when only someone was alive, could they be restored to help. And once they were dead, they were lost forever. That there was no hope after that. And when this bad news came to Jairus, Jesus heard it and did something interesting. He ignored it. Verse 36 says it this way. Ignoring what they said, Jesus told the synagogue ruler, don't be afraid, just believe. Don't be afraid, just believe. When you feel like you're ready to give up, don't ever, ever give up. Jesus goes to the house. He clears out those who are uh, grieving and moaning and, and uh, mourning the loss of this child. And, and he sets them aside. He pushes out that which is negative. And he begins to cast a new vision. What's all this commotion, Jesus says? The child is not dead but asleep. Now, all the people there knew she had died. And so he begins to remove those professional mourners. And he speaks directly to the child. And it's interesting that in this case, Jesus is reaching out and grabbing the child's hand says in verse 41, he took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. Throughout this story, the only place where we find Jesus touching people, touching anyone, is here. The suffering woman touches the edge of his garment. The suffering man who is the legion is spoken to, but he's never touched. And here he takes tenderly the little girl's hand and speaks to her. And she's restored and lives again, acting, uh, the scripture makes it act like she's just a normal 12-year-old little girl. And then he says something to give her some food. And I think this is a way of saying, a concrete way of saying that she's really alive and not just a ghost. Throughout this series, I've been asking two questions. The first is this, who is Jesus? And the second is this, how then should we live? What should we do in response? So here's who Jesus is at this moment. He is the one who is the healer of those who are desperate. He has the power to raise the dead. He, is, he has the power to heal those who reach out to him in faith. And in this story, he is the one who touches those who are considered unclean to make them clean. The man possessed by demons is restored to life. The woman who is suffering and bleeding for 12 years is healed. A 12-year-old dead girl is resurrected with the touch and the call from Jesus. 
That's the first part of it. The second part of this interesting story is that Jesus doesn't care about status, economic conditions, or who we are. That whatever our circumstance is, whether we're wealthy or we're poor, whether we're named or un- and known in our communities or we're unnamed and unknown in our communities. The important thing is when we're all helpless in our situation. Until Jesus comes and restores and heals and resurrects us, we can never give up. So how are we to live? Here's what I encourage you to think about. that When you're ready to give up, let Jesus be the hope in your desperation. That you can humbly approach Jesus at His feet. Going all the way back to the the man with the legion, he kneels at Jesus' feet. Jairus kneels at Jesus' feet. The woman comes and kneels at Jesus' feet. We can boldly and humbly approach our Savior. In behalf of someone else, We can even reach out secretly in our humility. We can approach Jesus even when we're helpless as well. The most important thing that I have for you today is this. Echoing the words of Jim Valvano. Never give up. Never ever give up. Let me read just a quick little poem here that asks the question, Who touched me? T'was the master, the voice of the master, and the woman's heart beat faster and faster. Trembling, she came and bowed her head. I touched thee, Lord, What was what she said. But the master answered, Go thy way. Thy faith has made thee whole this day. Have you touched me? I heard it. "'Twas the voice of the Master, and oh, my heart beat faster and faster. You came with the throne uh, from, uh, to God's house today, but I felt not your touch as you went on your way. I was ashamed and bowed my head. Reach out a bit further next time, he said. Are you suffering today? Are you desperate then hear this prayer praying for you. Almighty God, we pray for our brothers, our sisters, that they may be comforted in their suffering and made whole. And when they're afraid, give them courage. When they feel weak, grant them your strength. When they are afflicted, bless them with patience. When they are lost, Offer them hope. When they're alone, move us to their side. And when death comes, open your arms to receive them and heal them. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. If you want to join me now, join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I hear these words of blessing on you. May the Lord who heals all your iniquity bless you and keep you. May the face of the Lord who heals all your afflictions shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the light of the face of God, our Lord, redeem you so that you may be lifted up and healed today. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And amen.